Bang, bang, bang. My name is Matthew Steiner. Matt Steiner is a senior crime scene analyst and veteran investigator of over 21 years. Today we're going to break down the portrayal of forensic science in TV and movies. As we're critiquing these clips, understand that their goal is to entertain, and they definitely do that. NCIS Personal Protective Equipment. No rule number two is always wear gloves, but when there's this much blood... Rain here. In the truck. So in this scene, uh, they actually talk about wearing personal protective equipment. Rain here. Yet no one is wearing any sort of garb. What happened? Everyone is wearing just like a jumpsuit or their regular attire and just gloves. Basically, you would never want to do that. Well, apparently that one did. Beyond that, our crime scene technician, he's taking photographs. He then wipes his brow. Then he handles evidence. Basically what he's done, he's taken DNA that was on that camera, on his brow, and put it onto our evidence on the scene. And then proceeds to have a whole conversation while holding that evidence right by his face. Did you see the counselor? That was a pretty good movie. Again, improper procedure for collection of DNA evidence. He could have been wearing a Tyvek suit, a mask, he may even want to wear goggles or glasses, and multiple layers of gloves. Rule number two is always wear gloves. I would strip out the outer layer of glove, put another layer of gloves on top of it, and then proceed to collect evidence. I think I found that out, boss. Recovering evidence, Zodiac. Okay, looks like you wiped the tab down pretty good. You got some blood over here. Prince? very well be initial observations that the vehicle might have been wiped down, which you can see sometimes with oblique lighting on a scene. You can see sometimes fingerprints. So that's a pretty good observation. Thank you. As we proceed to the other side of the vehicle, there's a shell casing on the driver's side front floor, which wasn't marked or photographed as far as I could tell. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, things got to be documented in situ or as is, as found. He just picks it up with a pen. Where has that pen been beforehand? You know, was it in your hand? Was it in your ear? Was it in your nose? Right here. You know, it's got DNA from who knows where. I don't know where this started. Unfortunately, I've seen this in real life. If anything, this is like a PSA of what not to do at a crime scene. That's one of those big things you wouldn't want to do at a crime scene. You're an idiot. Tire impression evidence, the flash. Getaway cars and Mustang Shelby GT500. Shelby's have a rear super wide tire specific to that model, 12 inches with an asymmetrical tread. I don't think anyone just by looking at a tire impression to say it came from a specific vehicle. Sorry. We would do some sort of dental stone casting of that impression, recover it, send it to the lab, and then there's a database which they can search to say what sort of vehicles it could come from. There's something else. Thanks. And there's a pen again being used to collect evidence. My dad gave me that pen. Which is improper. Before he died. Another thing you wouldn't do is if anything is inside of our impression at our scene, we would leave it there. We would cast it in place. We wouldn't sample it because you could be destroying treadwear inside that impression. Yeah, yeah, I did. After he samples with the pen. Fecal excrement. Animal, I guess. I don't know how he would know the difference between human and animal feces, which I don't think is realistic. Uh, no. Loaded weapon, examining a body. One raspberry push up, one orange. So what are we looking at here, Doc? Worst dress stiff I've ever seen. The stiff and I pounded a beat together for five years. So show some respect. So it's common for TV and movies to present crime scene investigation in this fashion where we have all these different people doing a million different things all at once inside of a crime scene. That means it's working. We want that crime scene clear. We wouldn't want anyone in there except the people who are doing the investigation. In real life, not that we would make fun of someone who is dead. Show some respect. But there is a certain gallows humor that goes along with crime scene investigation and death investigation. And it's one of the ways to cope with it is to adopt this type of humor. <laughs> I know. Fingerprint evidence. Uh... Oh, I'll tell you guys, just by looking at the scroll pattern, not the victim's fingerprints. This is kind of overkill. It's probably because it looked cool is the reason they put the alternate light source in there with fluorescent powder. It really could have kept doing just regular black powder. Probably is what we would have done in the field. You're kidding me. It's like prescribing brain surgery for a headache. So many freaks out there. Beyond that, the techniques aren't that great because they're using too much powder and then they're using compressed air to blow out the friction ridge detail. We would never do that. Jody Foster told me that. Also, right here, he calls it a swirl pattern. Just by looking at the swirl pattern, swirl pattern. There's no such thing as a swirl pattern. There's arches, loops, and whirls. So there's some parts of this that are true, but a lot of it is fancy. Which is me. How to get away with murder, detecting latent blood. So 
In this clip, way too many people inside this crime scene, all doing random things at once, just like we saw with the loaded weapon clip. Some people have gloves on, some people don't. No one is wearing a Tyvek suit or booties. And probably the biggest cardinal sin is that we have the suspect inside the scene. How much longer? Yeah, that's not reality at all. But they start pulling out knives out of a knife block and they swab, but they swab one side of the blade, not the other side of the blade. Nor do they swab the handle. Seems like a foolish move. The last step was to do luminol testing, and that's a chemical we use inside of crime scenes to look for latent blood. Everyone would have been cleared out of the room at that point. Is a possibility that luminol is carcinogenic, so you'd be wearing a mask as well as a Tyvek suit. Oh, you're being paranoid. But you know, they just start randomly spraying the chemicals, and everyone else is around breathing it. That's a no-no. And maybe he's just being smart. He's also using some sort of UV light with it, or some sort of blue light with it. Luminol, you don't need that. You don't need any sort of alternate light source. You just make the room dark. Uh, you spray it in combination with hydrogen peroxide, and if there's a reaction, it will glow. I'm going to run what's called a luminol test. So this is where they actually do get it right. <laughs> Later on, he's called out for diluting the blood by spraying too much luminol. The more luminol you spray, the more you dilute the blood. In real life, we'd be very careful on how much of the chemical we're going to add. There's other chemicals that will react in glow or chemiluminesce in reaction to luminol. Okay, all right, I get it. Ballistic and fingerprint analysis, the dark knight. That's poor kind of me. Gonna take ballistics off the shabbat bullet? No. Fingerprints. Recovery technique is pretty good. We would try to cut it out of the wall. This is your original scan. Here it is, re-engineered. And there's the thumbprint you left when you pushed the round in the clip. Ah, uh, this is completely impossible. Yeah. It's not based on any sort of science. Fair enough. The rifling inside the barrel is going to create markings on that bullet, which would have destroyed a fingerprint that was there anyway, let alone the extreme heat that would have burnt off most of the fingerprint. Good luck. Blood stain pattern analysis as portrayed in Dexter. The male victim was standing right here. The killer plunged his knife into the shoulder, severing the carotid artery. You're going to see we have Dexter doing blood stain pattern analysis. So over here, you have nice, clean sprays of blood. He gets the description and categorization of the blood stain patterns correct. Clean and easy. But that's really about it. <clears throat> First off, those types of patterns, you would never do that sort of reconstruction for. You would never do stringing for arterial gushing or, or cast off because there's no way that you could figure out exactly where it came from. Hey, you never know. As opposed to some sort of impact spatter from a gunshot or, or from someone that was beaten with a bat. So we're looking for a sushi chef. It looks like someone just took a bucket of red paint and threw it on one wall, and then someone kind of randomly squirted blood on another wall. So it's like a finger painting. Then to cast off, uh, they don't look realistic. They're a little more linear than that. They sometimes can be curvy linear depending on how you're moving your hand. But to say it definitely came from a sharp knife, not a sword, there, there's not really any way to say the exact object that it came from. Yeah, sushi chef. Bone collector, collection of evidence. We're going to need those handcuffs for me to Well, then we can remove them when I get here. Look in the suitcase. There's a small saw. I want you to saw her hands off at the wrist line. we got to have those cuffs for prints. This is not realistic at all. We would never destroy the body intentionally like that. It's true. To recover handcuffs, we would somehow get those removed. Saw off her hands. And she takes a couple seconds to try to remove them. They're stuck, so the next option is to cut off the victim's hands. I can't. No. There's still going to be blood that's going to be coming out of the other end of that hand, which is going to completely consume whatever DNA or fingerprints that would be on the handcuff. So, not a great option. Hey, why don't you knock it off, Link? I don't need to knock it off! Forensic Anthropology, Castle. Yo, this building was set to be demolished, that is, until the salvage crews tripping the place came across his body. Buried under the concrete, no less. You got a cause of death? Not till I do a full exam, but he's probably been here since they poured the concrete back in 1978. Anything else you can tell us about the victim? He was maybe early 30s and a sharp dresser. Check out that powder blue suit. In this scene, they're able to somehow miraculously perfectly excavate this skeleton fully intact. Buried under the concrete, no less. Unlikely. What? If you were to be breaking up concrete with sledgehammers or jackhammer, you would have already damaged it, probably crushed the ribcage, if not a bunch of the bones. I know who the victim is. 
What? Beyond that, to give it a general age estimation, I think that is possible. He was maybe early 30s. Your skeleton is going to age in a very predictable manner. I am intrigued. So that's what they look for, certain growth and then deterioration of bone. And a testament to the truly indestructible nature of polyester. Early forensic investigations in cold blood. Did you find any shell casings? No. Which means it. You can bet they didn't leave any fingerprints either. First off, we can note that they're not wearing any sort of personal protective equipment. Oh. We wouldn't want to just take powder and just pour it onto a surface and then dust that powder around. Man, man. We take that powder and put it onto a separate clean surface that's not related to the scene at all. Stupid. Other than that, they make an assumption that casings were cleaned up somehow or picked up. Any shell casings? Oh. Could have been a revolver. Semi-automatic, automatic weapon. Casings can be ejected out of the side of that weapon, but a revolver, that casing is going to stay inside. So that would be the reason why you might not have a shell casing at the scene. Probably. Criminal Minds, Crime Scene Analysis. Jane, Bernie, and Vinnie Dev were here. Jane tried to run, Vinnie didn't. How do you know? She's half under her desk. Which means she tried to hide and so found it. One of the worst things you can do as a crime scene investigator is to lose your objectivity. What if she was just sitting at the desk? Is that the position she died in? Maybe she crawled to her desk? So these three were stabbed and the rest were shot to death. They also make an assumption that we have one unknown subject or killer as opposed to two. Have you considered two killers? Yes, but the bloody footprints all seem to come from the same pair of shoes. It's possible that someone else didn't step in blood, right? Yes. Or that they both wore the same pair of shoes. We see this a lot. You would have to recover those shoe wear impressions and analyze them in the lab, which is a quick visual analysis. Couldn't give you that information. Evidence at a crime scene, family guy. And now, back to Jake and the fat man. Hey, look over here on the carpet. That's a cigarette butt. This is probably evidence. Yeah, well, can you bring it over to me? I can't move it. This is a crime scene. So what we see in here is the typical chalk outline where the body was. It's iconic. Well, can you describe it to me? But it's a joke. No one does that anymore. You're destroying evidence. You could be adding chalk on top of DNA that could be important or other trace evidence that could be important. <laughs> you know what? Forget it. Iron Man 3, the use of virtual reality crime scene analysis. The heat from the blast was in excess of 3,000 degrees Celsius. Any subjects within 12.5 yards were vaporized instantly. No bomb parts found in the three-mile radius of the Chinese theater. No, sir. This is something that could happen, maybe not to that extent that we see in Iron Man 3, but there is current research in the use of virtual reality and augmented reality to help assist crime scene investigators. Talk to me happy. So if we document our scene with a three-dimensional laser scanner, the laser scanner is going to collect millions and millions of points of data, and we'd be able to see anything that's in the view of that scanner. Yeah. At the end, we'll wind up with a three-dimensional model. We could then take ourselves virtually through VR technology, place ourselves in the scene to make observations, and those are the observations that we use for reconstruction. Where is evidence? What's the context of this evidence? What happened? And what order did things happen? Lots of pageantry going on here. Lots of theater. Minority Report, predictive crime analysis. Time horizon, 12 minutes. All right, what he's doing now, we call scrubbing the image, looking for clues as to where the murder is going to happen. Beyond that, the date of the crime, all we have to run out of the images that they produce. So in this movie, we see our precogs, our psychics, producing images of crimes that haven't happened yet. Precogs and see a murder four days out. Now, I don't think that that is ever possible, but there is cutting edge research and technology that does help us identify crimes in progress. Oh, this is good. One of those technologies is what's called Shot Spotter that identifies audio from gunshots and specific to gunshots happening in certain areas and giving it a GPS location. It's a park. Dutch police are using augmented and virtual reality to go back and look at crime scenes in the past to help in their analysis and reconstruction. Conclusion. With the increased popularity of these types of shows, the public's perception has been affected by it, both in positive and negative ways. On the positive side, we have more people coming into the field and more attention is being given to forensic science. On the negative side, things are always shown absolutes. The timeline of analysis is not true and not correct. Techniques and technology that are just not even scientifically valid and does not exist. Now, I understand that the goal of this is strictly for entertainment, uh, and it does that.